All right, Genesis 29. And then we will, let's see, we left off that verse um, fifth, uh, 15. We left off at verse 15. Now remember, the goal of Genesis verse-by-verse -verse Bible study is to understand each and every word. So literally, as I read the verse and explain every word, see if my explanation matches with the verse that you're reading. Because a lot of people will tell you the Bible is hard to understand, but what you're going to find out soon is, no, it's not difficult to understand. It is difficult at the beginning because it's foreign to you, the reading, the language, and etc. But once you get the gist of it down, then uh, the common sense gist will unlock and you'll get the language and the reading. It's like reading uh, when you go to law school class and you start reading uh, law books, you think that it's overwhelming. But once you read so uh, many of it, and get used to interpreting every word and paying attention to them and you utilizing them for legal purposes, then it's going to unlock and you get to read fast, actually. But the Bible is obviously much, uh, much more easy than law books. So uh, see if my explanation matches with every single word in the verse, because I could be lying to you too. So you got to look at the book and see if it's true or false. Okay, let's go to Genesis 29. Let's get to work. We are in verse 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? So Laban, he says to Jacob, Because you're my kin. So remember that language, brother, and we've seen that throughout the rest of Genesis 29, where we'll say father, brother, etc., all this is referring to kinship. It doesn't technically mean that he is Laban's brother. Sometimes you would say that to a fellow person who's very close to you or is bonded close to you. Some families would say that to each other as well. Uh, you're my uh, brother or, you know, some people might use it, use it more casually or slang, you know, you're my bro, something like that. So it's supposed to imply that kinship, especially within family. Because Jacob is Laban's kin, should Jacob serve Laban for nothing? So obviously not. If Jacob's going to serve or help out Laban in his home, he should get payment because he is his kin. Obviously, if Jacob's going to stay with Laban, during that time, it's going to be common sense since he's a grown adult that he's going to have to work his way. But even though he's going to work his way, Laban insists, because you're my family, I'm not going to just give you nothing. I'm going to give you payment. So he says here, what shall thy wages be? So that's self-explanatory. Uh, what do you want for your salary? Uh, what do you want for your payment? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. So Laban, he had... Uh, two daughters, it's self-explanatory. The older daughter is Leah, the younger daughter is Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, uh, tender but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. So uh, notice that contrast, but, okay? So meaning, so if we explain the second half, then we can understand the first half. So Rachel is supposed to be very beautiful, and she receives a lot of favoritism from people. That's a huge contrast, so it's very positive. Now, then it should be negative, the first side. Leah was tender-eyed. So a lot of people wonder, what does that mean, right? So if we are to give that contrast, one is it's definitely negative. So Leah was something in a negative sense weaker in comparison to Rachel's beauty and favoritism. So then, uh, what should it be? So, uh, tender-eyed. When you look up that word tender throughout the Bible, tender, what it will show is that fragility, okay? So it's supposed to show a fragility to the eyes. So it could be in this sense. It could be that Leah's uh, overall appearance gives that tender appearance. Whereas uh, Rachel, uh, to the eyes. So she, but Rachel has that favoritism and beauty. All right. She has that uh, more of that, I guess you can say, forgive me for using this, but more of that powerful aura in comparison to Leah. It could either mean that way. So Leah was tender to the eyes 
or it could be her own eyes itself. The only thing that could be uh, mentioned about her is that her eyes are tender. But Rachel, in contrast, overall is beautiful and well-favored. Whereas Leah, the only thing about her is her tender eyes. That's it. In verse 18, And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. So uh, Jacob, he loves Rachel and he wants, he wants her for himself. So he says, the wage is, let me work for you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. So Laban answers, it's better that I give her to you than that I give Rachel to some other guy. Now, remember, as I'm explaining, look at the verse and see if the explanation matches every word, okay? I'm trying to concentrate on every word as I explain it. That way you can understand the reading. Uh, let's see, I was right here. Uh, Abide with me. So Laban says to uh, Jacob, so just stay here with me in the meantime. Verse 20, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Now, how romantic, all right? How romantic. In other words, Jacob, he worked seven years for Rachel, but during that seven years, it only seemed to him just a few days, not seven years long. It didn't seem that long to him. Why? Because of that incredible love that he had for her. Now, this one, they, there are Bible-believing teachers who tie this to end times, or they'll tie it to the tribulation. So there are some interesting things. But there is one thing that I can notice here how we can tie this over. So if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, You've heard the saying that Jesus is coming soon. In other words, the rapture should be very close. The end time should commence very soon. And Jesus will come for us quickly and take us home to heaven. Now, notice that the relationship of us and Jesus Christ matches very well with uh, Jacob and Rachel. So the relationship of love between a man and a woman, husband and wife, and the church is likened to the bride or the woman, the wife, and Jesus Christ is the husband or the groom. If our husband is going to come for us very soon, and if the coming is very soon, why is it 2,000 years long, right? So it seems like a very long time to us. So why would we say very soon, very soon? Now, there are several explanations to this, but I want to stick to the context of Genesis 29. So I'm just going to give that answer according to Genesis 29. So one of the explanations is because of the incredible love that we have for Jesus Christ. Now, the thing is, when we keep looking at the doom and gloom in this world, that's why it seems very, very long to you. So the rapture and the coming of Jesus Christ for his church should be very soon. But then when we concentrate on the evil of this world rather than Jesus Christ, then what happens is this. Then it seems like a very long time. And have you ever been uh, in a waiting room where uh, that's entirely negative? You don't like to wait and they just... Every minute seemed to pass by, and it just makes it worse when you look at a clock. It just seems to go even slower. So when you look at something painful, something you don't like, it's slower. But if you look at your love for Christ, and your love is so deep, life just goes by you, and then it only seems very few days. So notice what the Apostle Paul had. He had the right attention. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. So he says that our affliction is very light. It's not heavy. And then he says it's only a moment. It's not that long. But to us, it seems very heavy. And it seems like a very long time. And that's the problem with us Christians. We're very fleshly. But notice right here, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
Uh, when we go up to heaven with Jesus Christ, the timeline pales in comparison to our life, to eternity. So that's what Paul's looking at. Notice in 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, a lot of us heard about the crown of righteousness. For some of you who don't know the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness is supposed to be the easiest crown that only saved Christians can get. The crown of righteousness is simply wanting Jesus Christ to come for us very soon. Now, obviously, you and I have that, right? I mean, you and I, who would want to live in this godforsaken world a minute longer and not go up to be with Jesus Christ, the one who died for you, and then streets of pure gold, no more depression, no more sorrow, no more pain. So this is supposed to be the easiest crown to get. But I wonder if it's as easy as we think. There is a way to lose this crown, and that is if you don't love his appearing. Now, the thing is this. You have to love his appearing, not love the escape out of the pain. Now, you might recall Pastor Dennis Knoll's sermon, which is very, very uh, eye-opening, is that he preached against us saying that, well, when we Bible believers want the rapture, it's not because you want to see Jesus. It's because you just want to get out of the pain. You want to get an escape card. You want to cop out. All right, so look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, Paul, he loved to see Jesus Christ. It makes you understand that if Paul said that at 2 Timothy 4, 8, then in 2 Corinthians 4, the incredible love he had for Jesus Christ made the entire lifetime of trial and pain very short to him. Now, if we had the same for Jesus Christ, it would be the same. For us. Okay, let's go back. Genesis 29. Genesis 29. Now we're going to look at Genesis chapter 29 and verse 21. Genesis 29, 29 21. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled. So Jacob says to Laban, All right, uh, give me my wife. That's self explanatory right there. I fulfilled my days. I've accomplished them. I worked seven years for your daughter, that I may go in unto her. So that, uh, that phrase is very common in the Bible. When the Bible talks about marriage, in our minds, we're thinking about going through legal matters and a ceremony and then putting a ring. But uh, in the Bible, when the Bible says married, which is why God is very strong against fornication, is that married is when flesh joins with flesh. That's automatically considered to be marriage. So when people say, no, I'm not married to the person, but then they commit fornication, that's a big sin. Why is that? The world doesn't see that as a big deal, but to God it is. Why? There's a reason. It's not just out of thin air. There's a reason. Because God views marriage as flesh joining flesh. But when you get flesh joining flesh, then a different flesh, then a different flesh, then another flesh, and then they divorce, basically, right? Because they don't go back to that person due to a new relationship or just because, you know, somebody just got too drunk and, hey, they just had, a, uh, they just had you know, one night together or whatever. And then even in marriages, they're breaking apart and they allow, you know, flings or they'll say it's just a fling or something. No, it's not. So to God, he sees that as something very serious. So when you see language like this about when somebody is marrying someone and then there's a sexual reference, don't be surprised about that. So then that I may go in unto her, that's obviously a sexual uh, combination right here, a sexual unity right here that Jacob's talking about. That's why the Bible says marriage bed, not just marriage. Okay. See that? So where do we get the idea of marriage bed? Why do we use that today? Because that bed where the spouse is lying with the other spouse is considered marriage. It's considered marriage in God's eyes. Okay, anyways, um, I could go to tons of verses on that one, but we're not going to do that, okay? So let's just, we got to move along over here. 
Uh, let's see, verse 22. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. So Laban, he gathers everybody together, the men of the area, and then he holds a feast for everybody, a party. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. So it just so happened, that's what and it came to pass mean, that's a common phrase you notice in Genesis. So it just so happened that in that evening, so notice it's dark, uh, Laban takes his own daughter Leah and brings Leah to Jacob. And he went in unto her. Notice right here that uh, Jacob, he does uh, sexually lie with Leah. Verse 24, and Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah his maid for a handmaid. So here's a side note. An additional note is that the author's writing, Laban also gave his daughter Leah a maid uh, to be Leah's handmaid. And the name of that maid is Zilpah. And it came to pass that in the morning, so again, and it came to pass meaning, it just so happened that in the morning, so now this is bright light. Remember, it was dark before. Now this is bright light. Behold, it was Leah. Notice the wording of that. So in other words, it must have been quite a shock to Jacob. Like, lo and behold, what a shocking surprise. It was Leah. It wasn't Rachel. And he said to Laban, what is this that thou hast done unto me? So Jacob is upset at Laban. What's this that you've done to me? Now, a lot of you might be wondering, how can any fool not see that? <laughs> Why was Jacob so blind to not see that? Now, I believe that there is an explanation in this passage. So go to Song of Solomon 5. Song of Solomon chapter 5. It seems to be common, so I'm saying it seems, because I don't know 100%, but what I notice with other marriages, they seem to do this. But it seems like in biblical times, or during ancient times, there were people when they do get married to each other, that uh, the bride, she wears the veil, the covering. And then, as they join the marriage bed, it's dark at night, and at the same time, she still has her veil her covering. So that might be the reason why. So we're going to look at Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Notice in verse 2, this is the bride speaking, okay? She's just getting married to her husband. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. So notice right here at verse 2, the bride, she's sleeping in bed, and the husband is about to come to her. Now, if that's the case, now notice right, uh, if you know the rest of that chap, uh, chapter, what happens is that the husband doesn't turn out to be there. But look at verse 7, what she was wearing that whole time while she was in bed. Verse 7, the watchmen that went about the city found me, and they smote me, they wounded me. The keepers of the walls, what? Took away my veil from me. So that might be the explanation why, combined with the darkness at Genesis chapter 29, would explain uh, why Jacob was unable to recognize uh, Rachel and he, he saw the woman turned out to be Leah. Go to Genesis chapter 29 and then verse 25 again. The last line in verse 25 Jacob uh, says to Laban, Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? So Jacob says, So why did you deceive me? That's what beguile means. Now this is very eye-opening right here. Notice uh, irony number one right here. Why have you deceived me? That's funny for a guy who was used to deceiving people. That's irony one. Here's... a. Here's the funny thing, number two. Look at verse 26. And Laban said, it must not be so done in our country. So Laban answers, this, this is a sly guy too. So Jacob's truly reaping what he's sowing. God's giving him a deceiver so that Jacob could understand how being deceived feels like. So then Laban says, 
you know, it's not the custom of our country to do it like this. It must not be so done. To give the younger before the firstborn. <laughs> what an answer. He says, it's not the custom of our country to give the younger before uh, the older person. The firstborn, the older person, uh, should be given away first. So Leah should be given first, then Rachel afterwards. That's Laban's excuse. Now that's a funny thing, number two. Notice what's naturally done, the norm is that the right goes to the firstborn, not to the younger. Now, why is that? Can you imagine the Holy Spirit giving Jacob a huge kick and then he feels that? Because what did he do? He stole the norm of the firstborn for himself with Esau. And then what happened was now he gets that in return. Oh, it must not be so done. The Lord's way of handling things, of judging things, how he takes care of his children, you don't have to worry. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He takes care of them. A lot of people wonder, you know, why do saved Christians think that they can get away with their sin? No, that's not true. If you are a child of God and God is supposed to be a good and just father, he has to set you in place. And trust me, he will. Okay, another thing right here. Let's look at verse 27. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service, which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. Okay, so let me explain that. So Laban's saying, finish her, and this is likely Leah, her week. So then there seems to be like a timeline of the marriage, the wedding. It's not just uh, one day. You know, it can go actually a week long or perhaps even longer. Let's look at the book of Judges. We're going to look at one example here. Go to Judges 14. Judges 14. Notice that Samson, when he got married... And notice that it's also the same time when he's in the marriage bed with his wife. So notice how this story matches up very well with Jacob. So that seems to be the norm that time. That uh, while they have the marriage bed, the party is still going on. So then they continue partying. Let's look at the book of Judges chapter 14. Notice that the passage reads here, uh, verse 10, verse 10. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. It's the same thing like in Genesis 29, the Laban gathered the men together, right? So that they can enjoy a feast. So this is very, very, uh, it just matches well. Verse 12, and Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if ye can certainly declare it me within what? The seven days of the feast. So that seems like a norm, that it went a week long or seven days during the, a wedding feast. That matches with uh, Genesis 29. Laban says, finish her week. All right, going back to Genesis 29. Genesis 29, let me explain the rest of that passage. Now remember, bookmark this chapter because we're always going to go to it immediately. So notice how my explanation matches a verse, or if it does, make sure... Laban says, we will also give you, Rachel, for the service which you're going to serve me yet seven other years, seven additional years. Now Laban, I, it's a sneaky guy, he says, we will give thee. You know, is that not I? You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to put that blame in verse 26, you know. It must not be so done, done in our country. That sounds like your typical government, right? Yeah. Rather than any single politician right. saying, right. it's my fault and I'll, you know. No, it's like, we, I can't help it. There's a higher authority and no, let me carry you on through this channel. Especially when you give them a stinking phone call yeah. in this uh, stinking liberal area, you know. And then you're trying to go by the legal proceedings and all that. Let, let me put you on hold. Or let me transfer you. No, I told you for a thousand times. Labans. You got a bunch of Labans in this uh, yeah. Bay Area. Liberal Labans, you know, that's perfect, perfect nickname. Liberal Laban, you know. Okay, anyways. Verse 28, verse 28, all right? 
And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So Jacob, he did so. So that's self-explanatory. So he fulfills the week. That's the idea. So he fulfills uh, Leah's week, and then uh, Laban, uh, let's see right here, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, and he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. So then after the week is fulfilled with Leah, Laban gives Rachel his daughter for uh, Jacob to marry her and so that she can become his wife as well. Verse 29, and Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah, his handmaid, to be her maid. Same thing what Laban does to Leah. Laban gives to Rachel his own daughter, his own handmaid, named Bilhah. And Bilhah becomes Rachel's maid. Verse 30, and he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. Now notice right here that Jacob, he not only... Uh, he not only goes to bed with Leah, but he also goes to Rachel. And notice right here, he loved also Rachel. So then it seems like that there is some kind of love toward Leah. Now that's going to be important because I'm going to show you something eye-opening later on. Okay? So it seems like that Jacob does love Leah. Because it says love also, right? Right? It says love also. So then if he also loves Rachel, that means he loves Leah. If that's the case, then notice right here, it says the last part of verse 30, uh, more than Leah. Notice this, it, the other part says more than Leah. So even though he loves Leah, he loves Rachel more. So it's more on Rachel. Now, why am I saying all this? Uh, I'll show you later on, all right? Just follow along with me later on. We'll likely come back to that one. And served with him yet seven other years. And then Jacob, he serves Laban seven more years. Verse 31, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now, notice that the Bible says when God sees that Leah was hated, not loved. So God sees it. Notice in God's eyes, God's point of view. Yeah. What he sees this as is hatred. Well, no, I love Leah. No, but if you love something more than that, then what God considers that to be is hatred. So this goes hand in hand together. So when you love something more then what this turns out to be is hatred. Now, this will be eye-opening to uh, what God talks about, that uh, no man can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other. Hold to the one, despise the other. What does the next part of that verse say? Do you recall? Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, if you know that passage, it talks about that you can only love one. You cannot love two things. But Christians nowadays, they always make the excuse that, no, I can love God and love the world. So go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. A lot of people don't understand that. If there's something you love more then God considers that as hatred. God considers that as hatred. And if you don't believe me, trust me, you will when I give this next argument, okay? But let's go to Matthew chapter 6 first, and then I'll give the other argument. Go to Matthew chapter 6. And then verse 24. The Bible says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve God and mammon. So you can't sin while uh, being on God's side, while serving God. You can't do both. You have to choose one or the other. And God says you can't, uh, you have to love one or you have to hate the other. It's not I love both. No, let's be honest, okay? 
So to you, you do love, all right? You do love uh, Leah, but there's something more you love. You love Rachel. And automatically, that's considered as Leah, who you love, is actually the person you hate. Go back to Genesis 29. And then you're going to understand more. I'm going to give that other argument later, which will be very convincing. Go to Genesis chapter 29. And then verse 31, the second half, the explanation for that is God, because Leah was not as much loved or hated by Jacob, he decides to open her womb. So then Leah brings forth children. But then he has Rachel barren. So Rachel does not bring forth children. Verse 32, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. So Leah, because her womb opened up, she was able to conceive a child and then uh, give birth to a son. She calls his name Reuben. Now, we're going to come back here. Let me know if I'm cut out of bounds, okay? All right. Now we're going to come to this chart. Now, I know what's going on in your minds. What is that, Okay. <laughs> What is that? Oh, what kind of chart is that? Yeah, I'm with you on that. So what is going on over here is also beyond me, believe it or not. So I have a hard time understanding this too. Now let me first explain the passage. The idea is, in that verse, uh, she brings forth a son, and then the son's name is Reuben. Now you're going to write a lot of notes here, trust me, and this chart will be a little helpful to you. So do the best that you can. I wasn't able to write everything because I didn't have time. So just uh, write along what I'm going to tell you. So Reuben's the firstborn. And Reuben, because he is the firstborn, his, the name means behold a son. Behold a son. That's what his name means. Now, there are several instances to notice. Go to Exodus 28. There are two chapters. You're going to go to Exodus 28 and then Revelation 21. You're going to go to Exodus 28 and Revelation 21. Now, let me explain how this works one by one, and that way you can understand this deep doctrine. This is a deep doctrine that I still have a hard time grasping. But I do know that Dr. Ruckman is on to something. Now, Dr. Ruckman, he mentions in his commentary this following chart. He believes, or uh, he supposes, uh, I don't know if he really believes it, but he supposes that the tribe of Israel is going to match with the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel will match with the 12 disciples, and the 12 disciples are going to match the 12 stones in Exodus 28, and then the 12 stones are going to actually match the 12 months. Now, the evidence for this is Revelation 21 and Exodus 28. There is no doubt. This one I do know for certain. I cannot prove that all of this matches up like this, but I do know this. There's something strange in Revelation 21. God always wants to put a 12 here. He could have just done seven, eight, nine, and then, but then he keeps saying 12 this, and then 12 this, and then 12 this. You know what he did? He did 12 stones. He did 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, and 12 months in that new Jerusalem. Now, that's beyond me. So there's something going on here. That's all I know. That one I know for a fact. There's something going on with, with this. But I don't know if they all connect like that, okay? But there is something going on. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21 first. The Bible says in verse 12, And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the what? Twelve tribes of Israel. And then notice that this New Jerusalem, this city, also has in verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and the names, the names of the what? 12 apostles, beyond me. And then verse 19 through 21, you see that? You know how many stones there are? 12. 
12, verse 19 through 20, excuse me, verse 19 through 20. That's 12 stones. Then go to Revelation 22, Revelation 22, and verse 2, Revelation 22, verse 2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. Wow. That's why there are twelve months within a year. Mm -hmm. See that? Because God, that's why he made twelve fruits, to match with every month in the year. Wow. So that it can go annually. So, for some weird reason, God likes to make his new Jerusalem... 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. So there's, a, there's something within uh, his personality that he likes that. And then why he wants to connect it all together. So that's why this, this is, as a matter of fact, truth. That all these four are going to be important. Also, isn't it interesting, some people will talk about birth stones. And then, they'll connect, and then the, astrolo the astrology people, they'll match it with uh, the 12 signs with the months, and then even with the, some of the names of the stones itself, which is very weird. So there's something going on. There's something going on. Even, uh, even other spirits besides God's Holy Spirit, other spirits out there in astrology, occult, and the spirit world, they know there's something going on. There's something going on with that. I just can't put my finger on that. Maybe one day I'll do a study on 12, okay? Uh, Brother Sean, thank you. All right, Exodus chapter 29, and then uh, we'll look, let's see, in Exodus 28, I said, excuse me, not 29, okay, Exodus 28. You know, I think I said that at my Revelation commentary, too. I pointed him out to do a study on that, too. I don't know why. I don't know why. All right. <laughs> yeah, 13 you can handle. All right. Ex, uh, Exodus chapter 28. Now, notice right here. This is very odd how God would do this. Now, in verse 17 through 21, 17 through 21, the Bible shows 12 stones. And these 12 stones have to match with the 12 tribes of Israel in verse 21. So they make this breastplate. You notice that right there? So then when they make this breastplate and then each different stone... They make sure that it matches with the 12 tribes of Israel. And what's very strange is, even though you might see different wordings from Exodus 28 to Revelation 21 with some of those 12 stones, Dr. Rutland believes they all match. They're the exact stones. And then he tries to ex examine and explain why. And then we'll go through that as I go through the 12 sons that Leah, Rachel, and then their handmaids uh, gave birth to. Now, here's another thing right here that's very, very important that you want to know. With these 12 stones, Dr. Ruckman, how he makes this sequence. Now, this is the important part you want to hear, okay? Why Dr. Ruckman sequences it like this and how he matches it up like this is because a verse, let's see right here. He puts it at verse 9. He goes accordingly to verse 9. And thou shalt take two onyx stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. Okay, so here's another uh, garment or material decoration that God wants them to make. He wants them to make two onyx stones and then put the names of the children of Israel on these two onyx stones. But look at this, verse 10. How he wants these names engraved is as follows. Six of their names on one stone and the other six names on the rest of the other stone Okay, you're going to put names, but notice God doesn't want it randomly. He says right here in the last part of verse 10, what? According to their birth. If God started the decoration of stones as according to their birth, then when he gives instructions on other stones with the names, what do you think the engraver is going to do? He's probably going to say what God would like it to be done is according to their birth then. So that's how Dr. Upman did it. How Dr. Upman did it is he goes by according to their birth. So we get the clue right here with the tribe matching the month. That's how he does it. He goes by the tribe according to the month. 
and then you can get the name of each son to match with each, uh, uh, each name of the tribe to match with each name of the month. Now, if the idea is this, that how we can get the tribes to match the disciple is as follows. Usually when tribes are mentioned or when God gives a list of a group, he goes by in order, right? So then when he does it by in order, he just doesn't start out with, uh, like for the disciples, Judas Iscariot, then Peter, James, and John. It's just a very negative thing. He puts Judas Iscariot last, all right, for some good reason. But Peter, he puts on top, okay? Now, the thing is this. When people give this list of names for a reason in sequence, when God does that, the Holy Spirit does that, when Jesus does that, in, and the writings point that out, here's the idea. This group, we go by this group. This is the foundation why we can match the other stuff, okay? The stones, we can match with Exodus 28. So we got that one. How we can have the disciples match up is, again, this is the foundation. If this is, if the 12 tribes are named in sequence, then when God gives the names of the disciples in sequence, then we can see that they would match. Now, again, I say that all of this is just a possibility, okay? The only thing that's factual to me is that these four, they have some significance to God. That's all I know. And that some uh, birthday is somehow connected to that. That's all, those are the only two factual things. All of this rest of the specifics that I'm connecting, I, it's a possibility. This seems to make the most sense from what I can gather. Okay, if that's the case, then let's go back here with Reuben again. Okay, go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. And then uh, let's see how this would follow. Because I'm going to be reading his uh, commentary. It's going to take me some time to find some clues. So y'all bear with me, all right? So Reuben, he's going to uh, match. Uh, let's see right here. I don't know why I put Topaz. He should be uh, uh, Sardius, actually. So it's going to be a Sardius stone. He, his will be a sardius stone. I don't know why I put uh, topaz right here. Okay. I see. I mixed it up. Topaz is right here. Now, what I'm going to read to you is the only thing, is the only clue that I can go by. So if there are some things that you find to be inconsistent or you're not sure, hey, I totally understand, okay? But I'm just trying to give you the best clue that I can. So I'm just going to read and then you just take as much as you can, all right? And then later on, the Holy Spirit will show you more and more. Usually one thing I learned is when you come to deep information, to not make a conclusion quickly because that's very uh, premature, all right? That's very immature. What you have to do is just let it sink in, okay? Uh, university students have always done that anyway. Don't tell me you understand everything that you read. You, you, a lot of times you just go by the answer because it just says that, okay, to get an A, all right? Not, you don't know every reason why. But there are just some things you take by faith. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. There are some things you just take by faith for fallible human beings and scientists who've admitted we can make mistakes. The past two years was evidence that scientists have admitted 50,000 times, well, we didn't know about this new information before. So that's why, you know, so the past two years was evidence of that. So if you can do that with university, you can do that with the Bible. If you can do that with fallible scientists, you can do that with an infallible God. Okay? Yeah. All right. So just do that with this information. Uh, let's see right here. Dr. Uckman writes that his stone would be a sardius or sardine stone. Dr. Upman says this is the sixth foundation of New Jerusalem. Now, if it's the sixth foundation in New Jerusalem, Dr. Upman also says Reuben would match Peter in the divisions of 12. This month would be January. Okay, I knew I mixed up somewhere here. Uh, this month would be January for the Gentile and March to April for the Jew. 
Now, I, I don't know where I got that from, <laughs> okay then. <laughs> I have, uh, I was really falling asleep here, okay then. Wow, uh, I, don't, I don't know where I wrote that. <laughs> this must be Judas Iscariot stone or something, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, okay. January, because uh, why does Dr. Upman distinguish Gentile and Jew? Because everyone knows that calendars, uh, Jewish calendars are different from today's calendars. So today's calendars are actually the Gentiles calendar. So the Gentiles calendar is January. The Jewish calendar would be March to April. Did it get all of that? All right then. Continuing onward right here, let's see. If it matches, so Dr. Upman says this, but if it matches the foundation of New Jerusalem, then it would be June for the Gentile, August, September for the Jew. No, I'm not going to write it out, all right? It's too much work. I'm not going to write it out for you. Just write it, whatever <laughs> I read. So Dr. Upman, remember, he's either going by the sequence of the tribes, okay, the birth, but then he's also wondering if it's going to go by the foundation of New Jerusalem. Because the New Jerusalem, when it has those 12 foundations, he goes by the stones that match the sequence of the foundations in Revelation 21 when you read that. So I, he's wondering if it's going by the foundations of New Jerusalem or according to the birthdays, uh, the birth. And that's going to match up with Exodus 28. It goes in sequence, okay, by their birthdays. Anyways, uh, let's continuing on. Now, Leah, she continues at the next part of verse 32. This gives the other argument here. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, uh, will my husband love me? So Leah, she says, why she called his name Reuben, behold a son, is because she said, it's for a fact God looked at my pain. So now, because I brought forth a son, my husband will now love me. Notice she felt hated. Now, even if you don't think, no, I love you, honey. No, your wife ain't going to think so. Now, don't give that excuse. No, I love you, God. No, picture it as a spouse. No, you don't if you love the other person. So that excuse ain't going to work with God. Because if you had a loving relationship too, a genuine one, that shows your relationship with God wasn't genuine, okay? But if you had a lo genuine loving relationship, you do know this. If the person loves somebody else, and says, but I love you too, then you're going to go, no, you hate me. You don't really love me. Okay, anyway, let's go back. Verse 33. So that hatred does match up. So the evidence is just look at your own marriage life. And that's what we are. We're married to God. It's that simple. So marriage should be the most logical rationale that would make sense on why this argument given from Scripture matches up. It's valid. Continuing onward, uh, let's see right here. Verse 33, and she conceived again and bare a son. So Leah, she conceives a child again and gives birth to another son. She says, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated. Well, that's very plain. See, Leah sees that as... The husband hates me, not loves me. Leah says, why I gave birth to another son is because God heard that I was hated. He hath therefore given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. So uh, Rachel argues that that's why God gave me this son as well, because I was hated, and I'm going to name him Simeon. So Simeon, if you look at that, it's going to match with the topaz, unless uh, I wrote it wrong again, so we'll see, okay? But Simeon matches with the uh, birth stone or the stone topaz. And let's see right here. Simeon, the meaning of that 
is, let's see here, hearing, hearing. That's why Leah says, the Lord heard uh, that I was hated. So Simeon means hearing. He matches the topaz here, like I mentioned before. And then topaz is the ninth foundation in New Jerusalem. Okay, here it is. That's why I wrote that. The Gentile, if it matches with that ninth foundation, the month would be November. Uh, and then for a Jew, it would be November to December. But if we're going to match it according to the number on the breastplate, like we've done before, then it would be February. February for Gentile. And then the Jewish calendar would go April to May. It would go April to May for the Jew. All right, did it get all of that? All right, and then let's see. The next disciple, uh, Peter, I think it's Andrew, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to take the chance. I don't want to write something wrong. Okay. I think Dr. Upman forgets to write the disciple's name over here, but uh, it should be Andrew, unless I'm wrong. Okay, let's, continuing, uh, let's continue on. Levi is the next person. In verse 34, and she conceived again and bare a son. So <laughs> Leah conceives again. So God's taking care of those who are hated. He knows that Leah received an unfair deal, that this should be uh, Jacob's uh, problem and Laban's problem. But then God, he takes care of Leah, gives uh, one of the greatest joys to mothers, is uh, a child. So she conceives again, brings forth a son, and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. So Leah saying, Now this time, because I gave birth to three sons, my husband will join with me. Well, that's very sad. Uh, it shows that Jacob was neglecting her. The next part, therefore was his name called Levi. So that's why his name is Levi. Levi means to join. Levi means to join. And then over here, Levi would match the carbuncle. He would match the carbuncle. And then Dr. Upman says, we therefore have only one alternative in matching it with a month. It would be March for a Gentile and then May to June for a Jew. The birthstone for March is the bloodstone or aquamarine. Aquamarine or bloodstone. Going back over here, I'm just making sure that I'm giving everything correctly. I don't want to uh, say anything wrong. Let's see. Dr. Upman writes, the breastplate stones would match the lists in Numbers 1, 1 through 15, or chapter 1, verse 20 through 43, or 2, or 7, or 10, or Numbers 13, 26, or 34. <laughs> in which case they will not match the list in Genesis 29. We are here matching the breastplate stones with the order of Genesis 29. The, car bar, the carbuncle is found in Isaiah 40, 54, verse 12, Isaiah 54, verse 12, and Exodus 39, 10. All right, the next son, next son, verse 35. And she conceived again and bare a son. That's self-explanatory, so I'm not going to explain that again. I explained that phrase before. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. <coughs> so she gives birth to a fourth son. So now she's pray she said, because of this, I'm going to praise God. Thank you, Lord, so much. So she calls his name Judah, and now she stops bearing seed. Boy, you got to realize that Rachel is really upset. Rachel's really upset after that. Finally, you stop bringing forth children. You know, that's what the idea goes. Judah, yes, it means praise. That's why his name was given as such, because Leah was praising the Lord 
for an, oh, an abundance of children. Oh, excuse me, that, this is a stone, not the name. All right, so Judah means praise. His stone would be an emerald. That's what Dr. Upman says. His stone would be an emerald. But why put emerald right here? So let me see right here. His stone would be an emerald. All right, I'll just write it. What's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> ah! <okay. laughs> All right, stop. I thought you said wrong column. I was about to throw that this eraser at you. <laughs> All right. His stone would be an er emerald. And then Dr. Upman writes here, for Judah is the fourth son, which the fourth stone that matches the fourth foundation. Now that's quite a coincidence. So it seems like the foundation matches up. The emerald, the bright green stone, is found in the fourth foundation of New Jerusalem. If the number is that of the foundation, then the Gentile month would be April, and the Jewish month would be June to July. This time, the same thing holds for the stone number as the foundation number. So let's put him with uh, April for Gentile. And then June to July for the Jewish calendar. All right. Now, Dr. Upman says this, which is pretty interesting. One could liken him to Paul because of that uh, special favoritism. But technically, Paul is the 13th apostle, one outside of the 12. Philip is the fourth in the two listings of the apostles. But there are three lists. So that's what Dr. Upman says. Again, complicating the system. It would take a mathematical genius of greater caliber than Einstein to work out the format as it is revealed in scripture. But since men of Einstein's mental abilities very rarely have the humility or the common sense necessary to be saved or to find the truth, <laughs> the divine astrological Ouija board will probably remain hidden until after the rapture. That's what he complains. <laughs> So he's just ranting over here. <laughs> we'll put him then with Philip, maybe. Okay, we'll put him with Philip. This is disciple. Then this aquamarine. How did I put carbuncle right here? This is so. Okay, I'm even getting confused. I don't know how this happened. Okay, let me go back here. How did I do that? I said carbuncle, aquamarine. Uh, I don't want to give some contradiction here. This is Levi, right? Oh, carbuncle is the same thing as that. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So it's an aquamarine bloodstone. It's the same thing with carbuncle, actually. Oh, my goodness. All right. How confusing. Okay. Let's see over here. He doesn't give the names of the disciples of these two individuals to my knowledge. So you're going to have to look up the list yourself of the disciples and then see which one would match the best with them. Now let's go to the next chapter. Now let's go to the next chapter. Chapter 30. Chapter 30. Oh, it's time. Okay, sorry. All right, we didn't come to the most interesting person. Dan. Dan. And I don't think he's emerald, so I'll erase that. But we'll come to him later. Dan could be that lineage where the Antichrist comes out. I'll explain later, okay? All right, next Genesis study. Not today, not today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching uh, was a blessing to the hearers. And uh, bless the uh, break time, the fellowship, and everything we do. May it give glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.